morning and welcome to the Hudson Institute. My name is Surka Petrovic and I'm a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Uh, and I will be your host today during this panel discussion on the, on the controversies surrounding the proposed policies for standard essential patents. As many of you know, standard essential patents are patents that are essential to practice industry standards such as the 4G or the 5G standards. In December 2021, the Antitrust Division of the U.S. Department of Justice published a draft policy statement on standard essential patents in which it basically made two proposals. First, it outlined a framework that parties should follow when negotiating a license for standard essential patents. And second, it suggested that injunctions should be hardly ever available against infringers of standard essential patents. Uh, the DOJ received many comments, over 1,000 comments on this draft policy statements, and several comments were highly critical of the proposed policies. Uh, most notably, former heads of agencies from both Democratic and Republican administration criticized the proposed policies for ignoring the implications that they would have on U.S. technological leadership and on national security. We have also seen that a group of ex national security experts has made similar comments and small inventors and university cities have also commented, also raising concern in particularly in relation to the proposed approach towards injunction. So long story short, there were really a lot of um, concerns with the proposed policies towards standard essential patents. To understand better these concerns, we have with us an excellent panel of speakers. We have with us Diana Ocon, former chair and commissioner at the U.S. International Trade Commission and managing partner at AMS Trade. We have with us Steven Susalka, CEO at Autumn. And we have with us Kristen Osenga, Professor of Law at the University of Richmond. Welcome everyone and thank you for being here. Let me start with the general question for everyone. You have all submitted comments in this consultation and you all express concerns with the suggested policies towards standard essential patents. What are your, in your view, the main concerns with the draft policy statement? Um, maybe Commissioner Ocken, I'll start with you. Well, thank you, Erska. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to uh, share the virtual stage with, with Steve and, and Kristen uh, and discuss this topic today. Um, maybe I'll start um, with a couple of big picture concerns that I see with the policy statement and then a couple of, of smaller ones um, in, in terms of looking at this from a former ITC commissioner's standpoint. Uh, first of the big picture, what concerns me about the policy statement in particular, um, essentially going to your second point of denying injunctions in most instances, is that in, in my view, the reason the United States has been successful and has, a very, has had a very innovative um, uh, ecosystem uh, for companies is because of strong intellectual property rights, including enforcement at the border. And I think that strong intellectual property rights protection has helped incentivize long-term investors, investments in um, emerging technologies where you don't know where your return will be. And I think by taking away one of the tools that IP rights holders have um, for protecting that intellectual property, we undermine those incentives. And so that's a, it's a big picture concern. And kind of the flip side of that to me is that we are giving an advantage to our strategic competitors. I would say China in particular, which um, has a lot of companies who are, who are implementers of standard essential patents. And for them to look at what the United States is doing um, instead of continuing um, to have a strong intellectual property rights um, enforcement regime, we're essentially weakening it. And I would think that would only incentivize them to, con to uh, to try to use as the standard essential patents um, without fear of, of being um, having an, uh, an injunction or in the case of the ITC, an exclusion order enacted against those, those products containing that. So those are kind of the, the big picture. 
And then briefly, maybe just a, a smaller picture coming from a former agency official. And I think this is somewhat reflective of, of what we saw in some of the comments. And that's that while the policy statement um, says it's not uh, adopting a legal framework, in effect, it is. Uh, for the ITC, it upends the statutory framework um, by saying that the ITC would have to treat standard essential patents differently than other patents. And of course, Section 337, the, the law is um, patent neutral, it's technology neutral, it's one of the, I think, the beauties of the system. And then it also, um, would impose on the ITC a particular structure for how to um, analyze standard essential patents uh, as if they're another uh, separate kind of public interest factor as opposed to under the current law where once the de ITC decides there is a violation, it could be a violation of any patent, including a standard essential patent, then the ITC looks at that impact of excluding those particular products on US consumers, on competitive conditions, on like or or, uh, competitive products, um, and, and, and decides whether or not an exclusion order should go into effect. And then there's a further level of review from the president where the president could, could disapprove an exclusion order on policy terms. So again, the draft policy statement uh, takes a really upends that statutory framework and that concerns me. Um, and I think it should concern uh, the Congress and our legislators um, because if you were gonna make this type of change, it seems like it should go through Congress. Why don't I stop there and hear what others have to say. Great, thank you. Uh, Steve, do you want to go next? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, and, and again, I just want to uh, echo uh, Deanna's comments. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Erska and the Hudson Institute for having us. Uh, looking forward to this conversation and, and uh, working with my two panelists on, on this really important discussion. Uh, as, as Erska mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, my name is Steve Susaka and I'm the CEO of Autumn. Uh, Autumn provides a unique perspective to this uh, conversation in that Autumn is a nonprofit association focused on supporting and advancing technology transfer worldwide. And so we come at this perspective from um, uh, our 3000 plus members that belong to predominantly public sector research institutions such as universities or hospitals or research institutes that are actually uh, many of the um, uh, innovating institutions that are developing those technologies that might turn into uh, those products and services of tomorrow and potentially those standard essential patents of tomorrow. And so uh, we felt uh, compelled to weigh in on this, even though our members by and large, um, their technologies are so early stage, they're often not yet into the um, uh, standard essential patent uh, realm. Yet we still felt that it was really important to weigh in. And really um, uh, our perspective is, and, and even though we don't have a, a number of, of uh, standard essential patents uh, to, to discuss in, in this case, the important issue is, is the one that both uh, Erska and Deanna raised. And that was the fact that patents should be treated as patents, regardless whether they're standard essential patents or not. They don't, you can't have two separate sets of rules. And that's almost exactly what's occurring in this new draft policy statement, which is actually going to have um, uh, significant repercussions on the innovation ecosystem, uh, as was mentioned earlier. Now, um, I, I think, you know, there are a couple things that, that I wanna highlight here. Uh, and, and the first is um, when you think about this, uh, when you think about standard essential patents, um, one of, uh, frankly, the, the most um, important and, and only right that a patent grants you is the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering to sell, and importing uh, your invention. And what this uh, draft policy does is it defangs the only recourse that you might have, and that is in providing um, that injunction. Uh, and so it, it's going back, it, it's taking away what was um, uh, recognized better in the 2019 statement into this new one, where now you almost can't use injunctions whatsoever as an innovator. 
and we can get into this a little later in the discussion, but this is going to have a chilling effect in innovation, uh, and that's going to affect the next generation of products and services. Thank you. Kristen? Great. Um, thanks, Ershka and, and Hudson, and, and I'm so excited to be here with uh, my fellow uh, panelists. So uh, I weighed in on the policy statement and comments filed on behalf of a number of professors and economists, naturally. Um, so my remarks today are my thoughts, but honestly, they're reflective of the main points behind a number of the academic comments that were filed uh, with respect to the policy. So I think the two biggest concerns with the draft policy are first, it is not based on evidence or economics. Uh, and second, and, and somewhat related to the first, the draft policy represents a lack of balance and it puts innovators at a significant disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis implementers. So I was recently on a panel with a representative from DOJ who stressed that the draft policy was indeed balanced, and she implied that anyone who understood it otherwise, like, like me, uh, had not read it carefully enough. Um, and, and to be fair, the draft policy does state its goal is promoting a balanced, fact-based analysis that will facilitate and help preserve competition and incentives for innovation, and that all sounds great. However, the draft policy starts from a premise based on the presence of, quote, opportunistic conduct by SEP holders. And that this opportunistic conduct is gonna allow them through the threat of injunction to obtain outrageously high prices that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to obtain. And then the starting premise goes forward and says, this is gonna deter investment in an adoption of standardized technology. It's gonna raise prices. It's gonna harm consumers. It's gonna harm small businesses. So. The allegation of opportunistic SEP holders or SEP holders behaving badly is a callback to the 2013 SEP licensing policy. In a number of public comments that were being made by various uh, officers of the DOJ at the time. Um, and they, this was all based on this idea of these theoretical claims of patent holdup and royalty stacking. So even back in 2013, these allegations were not backed up by facts or evidence. But more critically, in the last eight to nine years, a number of very good empirical studies have been done that specifically refute that these harms exist. So this, this draft policy, despite claiming fact-based analysis, completely ignores current studies. And it also kind of fails to acknowledge the reality that a number of standards intensive industries show us via facts that these harms still really do not exist. So take, for example, wireless communication. Lots and lots of SEPs, lots and lots of intense standardization, but we don't see what we'd expect to see with patent holdup, <clears throat> high prices, low innovation, you know, one or two players in the market. Instead, what we're seeing is expanding output. We're seeing extraordinary innovation. We're seeing a number of new entrants and we're seeing happy consumers. And that's pretty cool, right? We've also seen quality adjusted prices are not going sky high as we'd expect. Instead, they're falling. Um, so the evidence and economics to support the need for even having one of these policies is simply not there. Um, and so then, despite this lack of evidence, the policy goes forward and sets up, um, as mentioned, this framework for negotiations and the, the lack of injunctions. So the draft policy pays lift service to balance, but it does effectively limit the remedies available to SEP holders. Now, to be clear, because I was corrected earlier, SEP holders are not quote unquote prohibited by the draft policy from seeking injunctive relief, but the regime proposed by the draft policy basically removes injunctions from the table. So the draft policy sets up, as, as noted earlier, a set of steps for negotiations between licensors and licensees which if the implementer refuses to accept a license, then the SCP holder can file a lawsuit, but the SCP holder can only seek an injunction if the implementer is deemed to be an un unwilling licensee, which can only occur once a lawsuit has concluded and the implementer, quote, refuses to pay what has been determined by a court to be a friend royalty. So, so this is like years and years in the future, you might be deemed an unwilling licensee, at which point at then, then you can seek an injunction. Well, by then it's too late. So yeah, the word prohibited doesn't appear, but it's, it, you can't get an injunction. You know, and on top of that, they, the draft policy says money damages are totally fine. So 
So the problem here is this protracted sequence of negotiations tying injunctive relief to a refusal to pay a court awarded royalty is a boon for implementers, provides zero reason for implementers to engage in good faith FRAND negotiations, still holds the innovator's feet to the FRAND-based fire, and eviscerates a large portion of patent rights by making injunctive relief impossible to obtain. So that really doesn't speak to balance at all. Tying it back to my first point, the imbalance alone is bad enough, but the fact the scheme was even put into place without any evidence means this draft policy is just a disaster. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, so we see a variety of, of concerns here, a concern from, about whether there is a need at all for, for such a policy statement, but then, then also a concern with the potential effects of this. Uh, of the proposed policies on a variety of issues. So, uh, Commissioner Okun, um, you mentioned several formal head of agencies have criticized this statement. And among others, we have seen head of, heads of, former heads of the DOJ, former heads of NIST, and former heads of the USPTO. Uh, and as we mentioned, from both Republican and Democratic administrations. So how, based on your experience, how significant is this to, to have such criticism that comes basically, that is uh, um, unanimous and comes from both sides? Well, I hope the significance will be that the administration um, decides that it should take time to step back and let even more stakeholders um, have um, a voice in this conversation over this policy statement because, um, I, you know, I think what you what you see in the criticism is um, many things that we've we've already talked about, but also the fact that you know there wasn't there. I mean, we now have a USPTO director, but all the heads were not in place when the policy statement went out. Um, this is uh, you know it's a change in policy um, as as we've commented on, and so you would think that you would want to have um, all the officials in place and then have a. Uh, a vigorous debate, uh, which includes the evidence that, that Kristen talked about, like looking at the studies that are out there and whether there are problems or not. It's certainly important to have a conversation about technological leadership. Um, I think the Biden, the, uh, the president's executive order that uh, I guess started this rolling, um, I, I think is the, the, the goal is good, right? The the, the conversation is important because we do want to maintain our competitive leadership. Um, but it, it seems like it started with an answer and then is backfilling with a policy statement. And I think we should start with what are the questions? What are the real issues? What, is, what, is, uh, what does the data show us? Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, one study that um, that I had heard about on a uh, in another discussion, which which is troublesome and seems like should be part of this conversation, is that venture capital, which often is you know the, the seed money that the smaller companies that that Steve and he probably has a lot to say on this, the, where where the money starts and where the money backs up these long um, long term investments, that that money is shifting away from the small inventors from the 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 sciences, the technology into kind of the social media platforms and, um, and that type of investment. And I think that's a question we should be asking about, like why, why are we incentivizing, why do venture capital, or why do they decide that's where they should be going now as opposed to um, supporting uh, you know, more of the companies that are doing the long-term science and technology that, that's really fundamental in all these, you know, we've talked about 4G and 5G, um, pharmaceuticals, bio, you know, I, I, I'll just say one other thing, and then I'd love to hear what others have to say on this, but, you know, it strikes me coming out of the pandemic that one of the lessons I take in as not as, as, as steeped in, in um, you know, the technology and, and, and everything that's going on, but, but just kind of having seen emerging technologies in, in my, both my former role and my current role, is that the, you know, the, the ability to get out these vaccines, to have the, the viral drugs, were great success stories of innovators at every level, small innovators, small companies who, you know, were able to get things to market. They then, you know, had um, larger companies come in and, and help, you know, uh, distribute and, and do different things. 
But it seems to me those are the, the types of stories we should be looking at and say, what incentivized this? And if, if it was um, that they knew they could, uh, if they made it, you know, and many of these companies fell, but if they made it, they'd be able to protect, as Steve said, that the right of their intellectual property is the right to exclude. If they're able to exclude, to recap that investment and, and you know, that that's part of the virtuous cycle. That's to me what, um, many of the commentators and the, the officials that, that you um, mentioned, I think that's what they were speaking to. Let, let's have this conversation, but let's have it at a, a very holistic level and not start with the answer. Yeah, uh, Stephen, the renewed attention for SEPs is allegedly driven by the desire to protect small inventors. And we have heard now Commissioner Ocon pointing on that to, to the need to understand how these policies would affect small inventors. So what is your view on this topic? Do you think that policies like the proposed draft would be helpful for small inventors? That's an easy one. And, and the answer is no. Um, there, there's nothing in the 2021 draft policy that actually incents innovators. Uh, to invest the time, energy, know-how into creating these next generation of products and services, given that um, almost all of their legal um, uh, rights are, are excluded from them uh, in, in order to, to, uh, to advance that, that technology forward. So I, 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 that's that's the quick answer. The you know the the slightly longer answer, and, and actually tails into uh, your previous question, where this uh, this policy um, has been um, uh, 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 has been negatively negatively seen by both Republican and Democratic um, uh, uh, professionals, is due to the fact that that innovation is not a red state blue state issue. Innovation is core to uh, American society. Um, and because of that, any move in, uh, in, in, in editing our innovation ecosystem uh, in a way that is not factually based, as, as Kristen rightly put, is really damaging. And that's why people are pushing back against this. Um, you know, the fact that it's based on the holdup myth um, is really concerning. Why would you create innovation policy that, of course, you want this to be a downhill gradient where the innovators have incentive to create innovations that will then be advanced by implementers? You want to provide that gradient. And what you've done is you've almost flipped it the opposite way, where there is no innovation, uh, there is no incentive to advance those innovations forward. You know, one of the things that I think about is, you know, Abraham Lincoln said it, uh, you know, he said, um, patents provided the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. Uh, and again, if a patent gives you the right to exclude others and you've just put that fire out, what's going to happen to the next generation of innovations? So very concerning. And, and again, I echo um, the comments of my fellow panelists that when you make these large scale um, uh, I'll put in quotes, improvements um, uh, and, and really deficiencies uh, to our innovation ecosystem. It has to be data-driven and based on fact. Uh, Kristen, as you mentioned, the policy statement would make injunction basically, injunction basically unavailable against infringers of standard essential patents, exception made where they are in contempt of court. So basically, even if an implementer behaves opportunistically during the negotiation, engages in tactics that merely seek to delay the execution of a license and the payment of the royalty, that infringer would still not face an injunction again, unless it refuses to accept the court determined royalty. Is it important to ensure that injunctions remain available against infringers that act in bad faith? Uh, well, I'm, I'm 
I'm going to change the frame of your question, because uh, to be honest, Ershka, I think injunctions as a remedy should be available regardless of the mental state of the infringers, good faith or bad faith. And so, uh, and S Steve mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I just, just want to repeat it and kind of amplify it, you know, just to think this through, patents are exclusive rights. And the only way to restore the owner of an infringed patent is to restore an exclusive right, and that's an injunction. Um, and so, although only the concurrence ever gets quote, the only concurrence that ever gets quoted in the eBay case is the Kennedy concurrence, where you know he calls out patent trolls and relevant to this uh, discussion, uh, devices with multiple patented components or SEPs. There, there's actually another a concurrence in eBay that nobody ever talks about. So, so uh, Justice Robert Roberts and he was joined by Justices Scalia and Ginsburg. They chimed in to say basically. While injunctions shouldn't just issue as a matter of course, as the federal circuit was doing, they should pretty much issue most of the time. And I really wish someone or anyone would pay attention to that particular concurring opinion, or at least give it a, a little bit of airtime uh, in relation to, to Kennedy. So because injunctions are a logical remedy for patent infringement, um, they should just generally issue. But also there's this idea that injunctions or at least the potential of injunctive relief is really important in making the patent ecosystem work smoothly, right? So the presence of injunctive relief actually encourages pre-infringement negotiations. It encourages pre-lawsuit negotiations. It encourages pre-verdict or pre-opinion settlements of cases. Um, and so without injunctions, those opportunities to have extrajudicial transactions around patents disappear. Um, now, as much as I like patents, maybe patents uh, injunctions shouldn't issue as a matter of course, go ahead, run the eBay factors. But I think what we've done right now is we've swung entirely over to the other side where certain patents, SEPs and certain patentees, SEP holders and patent trolls just cannot get injunctions. And that's a problem in and of itself, regardless of whether the infringer acts in bad faith. So I think even good faith infringers should be enjoined, especially if it serves the patent system. Thank you. Any other comments? I was just gonna mention briefly, um, so one of the things that, that's really important to note is this delicate balance between innovators and implementers. And, and it's really delicate. And when you have these shifts one way or the other, and right now all these shifts are going against the innovator, you're running into situations where you're changing the, the, the complete um, uh, 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 future of innovation. And so I know with, you know, uh, uh, disdain actually, um, this, this phrase of, of uh, efficient licensing. So that was used often, efficient licensing. Let's have efficient licensing. I, I, I think that that second word is actually wrong. I think the second word should be efficient infringement because that's really what this tilting of, the, um, uh, of this delicate balance is occurring. So right now you're getting to the point where a implementer can decide to infringe a patent, be in no fear whatsoever of uh, being uh, enjoined from, from actually uh, pr producing that product or service at all. And uh, one thing also, just to go back, Urshka, to, to what you had mentioned earlier about small inventors, those small inventors are really the small uh, entity in, in this relationship. They don't have the money. To, to fight off in many cases, these implementers. And so they're gonna go to court um, and potentially be just driven down by repeated um, uh, trips, which is gonna be challenging in the first place. If the patent uh, continues to stay valid and is infringed, and this is decided years down the road, what happens? The implementer now pays the royalty they would have had to pay in the first place. There's really no downside for the implementer, and there is a huge downside and a huge disincentive for the innovator. And, and that really is the definition of an efficient infringement. It, it, it makes sense for the implementer to infringe given the way the rules of, of this whole uh, innovation ecosystem has changed. 
Just, Erska, just one other thing that strikes me as part of that conversation that, that, that bothers me about the policy statement is that it seems like it's a very insular discussion, or I mean, maybe insular is not the right, correct word, but, you know, I, I think we should be thinking very globally about our place, right, in the United States and how do we maintain our leadership and, and certainly the standard setting organizations are a piece of that. And yet this policy statement, um, to me, sends all the wrong signals internationally and yet ignores that part of it, right? Um, it's as if, oh, you know, these particular companies um, we think they've been complaining and, you know, we need to we need to change the, the playing field that Steve's talking about, right, that, that the policy statement seems to, to uh, go against the IP rights holders. Um, and yet, you know, if you're looking around internationally about, you know, where the U.S. Um, provides global leadership, uh, it seems to me we're sending exactly the wrong signal. Um, and in, including for the standard setting organizations and, and kind of undermining where U.S. leadership will be because others will move into those roles if, if you know, if the United States moves out. And, and I think that that is a hole in the, in the policy statement um, and something that, you know, needs to be discussed more and, um, and thought about in terms of the national security implications and the economic security, economic and national security implications. And I think they go hand in hand. Uh, thank you. Kristen, um, several national security experts have also submitted their comments in this, um, in the, this consultation. And as we have mentioned, they have been highly critical of the proposed policies. So what is the connection between standards and national security? Um. Thanks, Erska. You know, that's that's such a good question. And as uh, Commissioner Oaken said, uh, it's, it's something that's being overlooked. It's it's not even part of the discussion and it really, really needs to be. Um, so so standardized technologies are everywhere. And, and oftentimes we kind of think 4G, 5G and, and we're good to go. Um, and that's true. There's a lot of standards, uh, standardization that's happening in telecommunications, but there's also standards in a lot of other places. So agro technology, autonomous vehicles, biofuels, personalized medicine, internet of things, so many important technologies. And many of these technologies are really important and implicated in national security. Um, it could be in military applications like you'd expect, surveillance, command and control, logistics, but also the very safety of American citizens, our healthcare systems, our food and other supply chains, are, are all dependent and implicate uh, standardized technology. Um, and so when United States companies are active participants and, and global leaders uh, in standard development organizations, they can play a role in both designing the future of these technologies, as well as ensuring that the technologies selected for the standard allow for national security. Um, and this, this makes a lot of sense, but now let's see how the draft policy lays on top of this issue, right? So if the United States starts to impose policies that make participation in standards development less attractive, as, as we've been discussing, right, it's tilting heavily in favor of the implementer and tipping away from the innovator. So, and the innovator is the, 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 the company, the innovators are primarily the companies that are submitting the technology to the standards development organizations. Um, so if we make their participation in standards development less attractive, by eviscerating the patent rights and, and this other uh, implementer bias system of negotiations, it would make a lot of sense that United States companies will start opting out of standards developments. And that means our companies and thus our country will no longer be leading the direction in which these technologies are evolving. Uh, and you might not think this is a super big problem, right? Uh, if, if some companies leave, other companies are gonna rush in to fill the gaps, but there's a problem because uh, um, China is ahead of the game here. So China knows that to control technology standards is to control the future. And so they have a plan to control standardization. Uh, so China is making efforts to increase the number of Chinese companies that participate in SDOs. They are placing more and more Chinese nationals into leadership positions at the SDOs. And they're encouraging these Chinese companies to submit more technology to SDOs. 
In essence, China is doing the exact opposite of what the draft policy is likely to do. And at the end of the day, our national security might be the biggest casualty because it will no longer be United States companies being at the part of this global leadership. So you may say, okay, that's nice, Kristen. Isn't this just all a big scary story? Uh, yeah, it's a scary story, but it's one that's already being told. So for example, Chinese companies have already used their technology to set up access points into telecommunication systems. Uh, in 2020, United States officials announced that Huawei uh, had included the ability to secretly access mobile phone networks through backdoors that were designed to be used by law enforcement agencies and all of the rest of the telecommunication companies uh, did not access, did not allow themselves access through these backdoors, but Huawei built its equipment with access for itself and logically China. Uh, and this is worrisome because a number of the United States military and economic partners, including the UK and Germany, had permitted the use of Huawei equipment in their country's 5G networks. So national security and the draft policy are intimately linked uh, in that we should not be actively discouraging United States companies from investing time and money into standardization. Uh, so while we may not want a government-led effort like China to force our technology companies' hands, we shouldn't make participating in standardization a losing bet if we're worried about our security. Thank you, very interesting. Any reactions to that? Well, just, I mean, I, again, I think Kristen's exactly right. And I think it's, and, and maybe Kristen can even elaborate on, on some of the studies that are out there, because I think it's, it's um, if you're looking at, and she's given the, the Huawei example, which is a really important one. And then there's all these other technologies that are implicated in um, the autonomous vehicles, I, I think Kristen mentioned as well. And why I think if you're just, in the abstract, talking about standard essential patents, and it's just this discussion and this policy, you know, this policy statement. I think it doesn't um, uh, focus enough on what we're really talking about, which is, you know, we are talking about the future, right? It's not just, you know, does your mobile phone? I mean, it is, it is the the undertones of your your phone, mobile phone, but it's not. It is, it is, uh, you know, very futuristic. Like you have to plan for the long, long term. And I think Kristen's point is a really important one, which is the Chinese are planning for the long, long term. And if we don't allow our companies to continue to do that, I mean, the race, the race is on, the race has been on, and to now kind of in the, the middle of it here to, uh, you know, put hobbles on our companies by saying, ah, we think, you know, there's, you know, you need to not have the ability to, to you know, uh, make sure that you can protect these standard essential patents in, in, in our court systems, which has been guaranteed and at the ITC um, through an exclusion order. You know, I, I think we're hobbling them without even having had a discussion about the actual impacts and kind of where these technologies play a role and where the United States is vis-a-vis -vis strategic competitors, including China. Yeah, and just to add on that, um, I think, you know, one of, one of the important recognitions here is the reason why, and, and let's just take uh, COVID vaccines as one example of, of successful innovation deployed in record time. The reason for that was because of a strong and predictable patent system that was cultivated over decades. Um, that's why those resources were available. That's why the funding was in place. That's why there were multiple um, uh, candidates in process that could be implemented um, uh, rather quickly and, and, and to you know, great effect. Uh, actually, I think that's, that is an American innovation success story right there. The, the fear here is in, in, in some of the things that this uh, policy statement are um, providing, uh, again, is shifting that platform, and that is going to have long-reaching detrimental effects to American innovation. Um, and it might not happen overnight, but um, it will happen long-term. And therefore, any of these innovation um, decisions need to be data-driven and factually based. 
Thank you. And Stephen, I have a question for you. In, uh, in its submission, Autun said that strongly believes that patents are not anti-competitive, but actually promote competition. Could you elaborate on this point? Yeah, absolutely. So um, give an example. Um, uh, I have asthma and I fortunately have the option of multiple different asthma medications that um, I, I can use. And in fact, I've used multiple ones and, and different ones work in different ways. And I've had this option of lots of different competitors that I could, uh, I, I could avail myself of. I'm very fortunate to, to have that, that benefit as, as do millions of others. So the reason for that is because of freedom of entry into um, that area. And so we'll, we'll just take, you know, asthma medications is just one example. Um, the only reason that someone would invest in the next asthma medication is because they're assured of strong and predictable patent rights. Those patent rights are absolutely essential for the development of that next candidate that may or may not turn into that next asthma medication. So in the absence of patents, you actually don't have competition. There is no reason for any big swings into advancing any type of technology significantly forward. The investment is too high. Um, uh, venture capitalists, angel investors will run the other way because uh, they won't be able to recover the investment that they put into this. And, you know, let's, let's take an example of, of VHS ta tapes. Um, VHS tapes, okay, you could just make, you know, slightly different, longer VHS tape, higher definition. All right, that's great. But you know what was much better than a VHS tape? A laser disc, then a DVD, then streaming. And what are those? Those are all patented technologies that significantly built off of the previous technology, therefore driving down the price of VHSs and now DVDs, and now we're on to the streaming level. In, in fact, it actually enhances competition going forward. In the absence of patents, you wouldn't have competition. And, and we see this, and again, I, I know we're talking about um, 5G, but you know, think about uh, orphan drug indications. Unfortunately, there are so many indications that have so few, um, uh, uh, so few uh, patients that there is no investment in those areas. And fortunately, the, the government has uh, implemented certain um, uh, areas in which they, they drive the incentive there, um, which, which is absolutely critical to do. But again, when you just get back to this idea of competition, patents actually promote competition. Um, if you look at things too narrowly and say that one drug can only be manufactured by one company for a certain period of time, okay. However, you gotta, you gotta broaden the aperture and look at the field. So asthma medications as one example. So I just wanted to share that, that perspective. Yeah, Ursi, um, can I jump in? Because uh, one thing that, that Steve, I just wanted to pick up on on this competition, and and I think it's been said before, but I think it needs to continue to be said. I mean, he's talking about the number, like in that point, like the number of companies that are developing, and I think he mentioned prices, which I which I think is a really important part of this story, right? Going back to what is the problem we're trying to solve here? You know, if prices are going down in these um, technologies. I mean, again, you want uh, you want investors to get a return on an investment, and there's there's pricing along those lines. But it's not that we've seen like people cannot get something um, that are that the you know whether it's a cell phone or um, you know Internet of Things or the Nest or whatever it is that's that's using standard essential patents. There is a lot of I mean I think there's and, and Chris can probably actually jump in with with, with um, concrete numbers, but you know of the the studies I've seen on the pricing the pricing has gone down. I mean, again, maybe a new product comes in and it gets high pricing for a while, but it continues to go down. And, you know, cell phones are a great example. They are all over the world, right? I mean, if if competition wasn't working in the standard essential patent arena with, you know, just focusing for a moment on, on 5G and cellular technologies, 
you would not see that, right? You would see really high priced products, which very few had access to. And that's when you'd say, hmm, or I would say, just speaking for myself, maybe there's a problem. Like maybe there is something going on here um, that we're not seeing. But I, I, the, what I've seen um, is it's just the opposite. I, do, I don't have the numbers handy that the commissioner Oakham I thought, but there, there was just two other uh, quick points I want to make. Um, the, the first point is in, in long standing in antitrust case precedent is, you know, it's, it's not a bad monopoly to earn your monopoly through, you know, being the best, being the most innovative, being having the best service, et cetera. And, you know, a patent simply is, you know, one of those indicators that you, you might have something that's the best. And so, um, you know, to the extent that the, the current administration is kind of pushing back into, you know, the, 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 the bad 70s and 80s where we thought patents were just bad and needed to be cut back, that, that's a little troublesome that, that patents actually do uh, help competition in the way that Steve says, but they're also a reflection of companies having competed to already be the best and then layer on top of that with the SEPs, right? Not only did they have the competition and innovation to get the patent in the first place, but then they also competed at the SDO to have their technology selected for inclusion in the standards. So, so SEPs have actually gone through two levels of competition to get to where they are. Um, that's, that's pretty awesome competition and innovation, not something that we should be uh, quashing. Thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we have come to the uh, end of our time. I just wanted to check if anyone has any final remarks. If not, then I would like to thank our panelists for being here with us today. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion. And I hope that, yeah, the DOJ will consider all these comments that they have received and then they will uh, take them into account when designing their uh, policy towards standard essential patents. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Roscoe.